Jesus said that when he would be lifted up, he would draw all people to himself. Hello there, welcome to Message Week Ministries. I'm John Classic. Jesus' act of drawing all people to himself is remarkable because it stands as the most amazing quintessential act of reconciliation. Jesus Christ is our Lord and King and Saviour and he said that what he was going to do was draw all people to himself. And so you and I, the broken, the guilty, the sinful, those who've fallen short of the law of God, the righteousness of God, righteously condemned to death. Jesus stands in our stead as the only one who could do so, the one who spoke everything into existence with the Father, the one who entered this world, the world that he sustains by the power of his word, and redeems us from certain death. And we have to ask, what sort of love is this? What sort of grace is this? Who is this God that loves us so intensely? that pays the price for us through his own blood. No greater love is a man than this, said Jesus, than a man laid down his life for his friends. And you are my friends, says Jesus, if you do what I command you. So barely can we comprehend this kind of love, this kind of truth, this kind of grace. It's extraordinary and the righteousness and sovereignty of God is displayed through all eternity. And this morning I want to look at that and explore that. That sets the framework for exploring the truth of God, His Word, His doctrines, the theology behind Christian belief. But we've got to start somewhere. And we begin on the premise of who Jesus Christ is. And we find Paul writing to those in Corinth, to those in Corinth. And he begins with the words, therefore, if anyone is in Christ. Now, the first question we have to ask is, what does it mean if anyone is in Christ? What does it mean? How does Paul understand it? How do the other disciples understand it? What does Christ mean for us to be in him and he and to be in us? Let's continue what Paul explores here on this very subject. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. And all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So God was doing something through Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who is also the Son of Man. And when Jesus says he would draw all people to himself in the ultimate act of reconciliation, we actually see that not only is Jesus involved in that, but we are given the ministry of reconciliation as his agents, as his fellow workers. So what God is doing in Christ and how he reveals himself is the one who's prepared to reconcile, to bring all things together in order, in beauty, not in chaos, in brokenness, in sin and depravity, but in beauty and truth and love, and care, forgiveness, wholesomeness. Verse 19, that is in Christ, this is what God was doing. God was reconciling the world to himself. Now this places a challenge because Jesus says, I will draw all people to myself. And we read here in Paul that God was reconciling the world to himself. Well, we begin to understand who Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the full expression from the Father. We'll come to that when Philip said, show us the Father. And Jesus says, Philip, have I been with you so long that you haven't seen the Father? To see the f me is to see the Father. To know me is to know the Father. God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting this trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself and he's called us as fellow laborers in his field. Verse 20, therefore, who are we? We are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Now that's very powerful and extraordinary encouraging that before we can embrace on this journey, before we can be reconcilers, 
we must be reconciled to God. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. That is the Son of God, perfect, with the Father forever. And he came into this world, lived a sinless life, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So what Jesus Christ did was redeem us from certain death because a holy, just, true law of God sentences us to death. And what Jesus Christ did was come into this earth as a total, as the perfect sacrifice, the pure Lamb of God, to take on himself our sin, and then as an exchange, attribute to us his righteousness. What love is this? What grace is this? How do we understand it? How do we understand if anyone is in Christ? He is a new creation. This is the ultimate in reconciliation. Reconciliation can only occur in Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ, by Jesus Christ. And if Christ lives in us, then we become agents of the same ministry, working for the glory of God in being reconcilers in our personal and our church collective lives. The opposite is also true. If we are not in Christ, no matter what sort of a benign and kindly life we live, on a human level, we might look okay. But we're all sinners. Every human being has sinned. And every human being is subject to the holy, just, true, righteous law of God that sentenced us to death. Because no matter how things look to us and how good our personal ethos may be, as the scripture says, that there's a way that seems right to a man. But the way thereof is the way of death. And that's the reality. That's the reality of anything that seems to be anything other than being in Christ. So Apostle Paul belabors that point. And I've often wondered many years ago when I'd read Paul's writings, everything that he wrote about centered on Jesus Christ. From the moment he was a persecutor of Christ to a preacher of the gospel of Christ, he, he says, if anyone is in Christ, I in Christ, um, I, I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. Paul's Christocentric theology is so powerful, so strong, and we'll see that as we go through it. So as a community of believers, an ideal church, the building block of an ideal church, a Christian church, is that Jesus Christ is head of the church, that Jesus Christ is Lord of the church, that Jesus Christ is the visible and spoken Lord of the church in a very powerful and a personal way that affects every member of the congregation. Now you may have as a part of your church culture or validity, theology, doctrine, prophecy, and a whole lot of other areas. Jesus Christ must sit on top of doctrine. Jesus Christ must sit on top of our theology in a very personal and a very real way. You can't have doctrine and have Jesus underneath that. Jesus is the Lord of all, and he's on top, the penultimate, preeminent above all things, as Paul says. So, what does it really mean to be Christ-centered? Well, how does that reflect in our daily work? What does it look like? What does a church that's Christ-centered look like? How does it function? How does it work? Where is its ethos? And no matter where we've come from, how are we going to rise above the limited viewpoint that we have, no matter what church culture we come from, no matter whether we are centered on truth or we centered on grace, the opposite ends of the pendulum. How do we come together in Jesus Christ? It's very powerful because Paul talks about Jesus Christ and, and, and tells us a little bit more about him. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, he begins in saying, he is the beginning of he is the image of the invisible God. Hold that thought, that Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. That he is the image bearer of the Father. Remember Philip said to Jesus, show us the Father? Jesus looked at him and said, Philip, have I been with you so long? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Remember elsewhere where Jesus said, I and the Father are one? Jesus Christ is the firstborn of all creation. 
Verse 16, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth. So when you think of Jesus Christ, he's creator of everything on heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And what makes it all the more spectacular is this Jesus Christ came and entered our world, divested himself of his former glory. In John chapter 17, he says, Father, restore to me the glory I had with you before the world was. So in entering and divesting himself of that glory, he comes with one singular purpose in mind, to reconcile us to himself and therefore to the Father. Jesus Christ is before all things and in him all things hold together. Every photon that comes from the sun that gives us light is part of what the Lord has spoken and sustains by the power of his word. He is the head of the body, the church. So this takes it more into our realm, the, the fellowship that we share together in church community. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Do you remember in, um, in Revelation, Jesus reveals himself to John the Apostle and he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Behold, I was dead and I'm alive now forevermore. This was the glorified Jesus speaking to, to John and reminding him that he was dead because he paid the price once and for all that we might be redeemed. And then John, Paul makes a profound statement about Jesus Christ, that in everything he might be preeminent. Is Jesus Christ preeminent in your life, in your thoughts, in everything that we are? It's a good question to ask. Is Jesus Christ preeminent in your church life, above doctrine, above theology, above prophecy, above culture, above tradition? Is Jesus Christ truly Lord in everything you say and everything that you do in all that you are it's a good question to ask ourselves verse 19 of Colossians chapter 1 this is about Jesus Christ for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell Jesus said to Philip if you've seen me you've seen the father all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in the Son of God. That's why he's the Son of God, but he's also called the Son of Man. And through him to reconcile all things to himself. There's the ministry of reconciliation. This is the purpose of why Jesus Christ entered our world. Rather than being the voice and the narrative through the Old Testament, at the right time, he came as the Messiah to reconcile all things, whether in earth or in heaven. And that's a good thing. We can understand reconciliation needs to happen here on earth. But there's also work being done in heaven on a grander scale that you and I in this physical time, matter and space continuum have very little understanding about, but it is revealed in Scripture, making peace by the blood of his cross. Now, what's really interesting is that Jesus came to his own, the people of Abraham, the children of Abraham, the children of Israel, the, the Jewish people, the Pharisees, for example. He came to his own, as John records in John chapters 1, and his own received him not. But those who did receive him and believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So there were a lot of people who did not receive Jesus. They did not believe in his name. And those were among the most educated erudite religious leaders of the day, namely the Pharisees. Theirs was a law-based, works-based salvation. They tithed diligently. They did extra things to protect the Sabbath. They were meticulous in living Torah, living law. But they never could understand or see the lawgiver who was living among them as the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to what Jesus says in John chapter 5, verse, beginning in verse 38. He says to the Pharisees, You do not have his word abiding in you. Well, they were the ones that were studying the scripture, presumably the word of God. And here's Jesus saying, You don't have his word in you. For you do not believe the one whom he sent. So you cannot understand scripture unless Jesus is Lord. You cannot have his word in you unless Jesus is Lord. 
because they did not believe in the one the Father had sent. Verse 39, You search the Scriptures, because in them you think you have eternal life. Well, isn't that noble to search the Scriptures? God's inspired Word? But they were doing it from a, a self-righteous viewpoint. So they could keep the law, and by keep trying to keep the law, they could validate and earn their righteousness and place into glory. Jesus says, you search the Scriptures. Well, there's nothing wrong with searching the Scriptures. So did the Bereans who wanted to prove what Paul was saying was true. You search the Scriptures because in them you think you have eternal life. And then Jesus points to what the Scriptures are really about. And it is they that bear witness about me. So all the Scriptures that they had at the time as we've compiled it from Genesis all the way through to Malachi, as we call the Old Testament, the Torah, the Psalms, the Prophets, the Wisdom Writings, all pointed to Jesus Christ. They're all about Jesus. There is His narrative, His voice. And then Jesus says to something to the Pharisees, You refuse to come to me that you may have life. But all who did receive Jesus and believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. So the religious leaders of the day resisted, persecuted, denied the Son of God, and they didn't realize that they were blind, wretched, pitiful, poor, like, as Jesus likened them, a brood of vipers, like whitewashed sepulchres, a tombstone that looks all beautiful, but inside is dead men's bones. But not all among the Pharisees this is where grace comes in. We see some breakouts from the Pharisees. One is in the story of Nicodemus. He was among of those Pharisees. He was a dyed-in-the-wool Pharisee, but he saw the miracles. And he took the mustard grain of seed, seed of faith. He didn't want to be seen by his, his unbelieving peers, and he went to visit Jesus by night. And Jesus confronted him. He said, are you a teacher in Israel and you don't understand these things? But what, what Nicodemus did was he took the opportunity to go and talk to this man, the Son of God. And Jesus talks to him in theology. He says, you must be born again. And they have this unique con conversation in John chapter 3. And in the end of the story, we see, I believe, Nicodemus becoming a disciple of Jesus. It was when Jesus was being interrogated, Nicodemus asked a question in the Sanhedrin. He says, look, you know, we don't try a man unless we've heard him. And of course, he gets laughed down by his peers. Now, when Jesus' body is being taken down from the crucifixion, we see Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus publicly displaying on what side of the fence that he was on, taking down the body of Jesus. We also see this in Saul the Pharisee. Jesus met him on the road to Damascus and said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? So Saul was persecuting Christians. And because Christ is in us and we're in Christ, Jesus said, this is personal, you're persecuting me. But Saul, the persecutor of Christ, became Paul, the preacher of Christ. And an extraordinary turnaround that reflects God's grace, even for those who are dead set against. Very powerful. And so you see this enormous pendulum swing from one side of the fence to the other side of the fence. Do you know this is true of Christianity today? I want to illustrate a little bit because, because there are two sides of the fence within Christianity. Now, I come from a background, and I'm quite happy to admit that, where I do understand a little bit about the, the, the pharisaical mind. I searched the Scriptures all my life in order that I may have under biblical understanding and live a godly life. I didn't understand grace too well. I was probably very judgmental of other people. And I see and I wrestle as I look back on my past, and I'm sure the Apostle Paul did, is didn't I waste half my life searching the Scriptures that I may have life and trying to create a works-based salvation? But I think, God, all things work for good, ultimately. When you read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, it must be confronting. Paul says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. 
It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. In other words, no matter how hard we try to earn our salvation, we're on, like the Pharisees, we're on the wrong path. We're given a gift upon repentance, upon faith, upon receiving Jesus and believing in his name. Because the other side of the pendulum are those who say, Lord, Lord, I love you, Jesus. And Jesus says, as recorded in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, who proclaims Jesus will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And then Jesus goes on to say, there'll be many in that day say, Lord, haven't we done mighty miracles in your name? Haven't we cast out demons and done mighty works? And Jesus will look at them and say, get away from me. I never knew you. You who practice lawlessness or iniquity, so you proclaim Christ without obedience. And salvation requires obedience. Total surrender to Jesus Christ. So there's something in this equation that Jesus Christ wants us to understand. There's a tension between law and grace, truth and grace. Let's explore that. I want to begin first where Jesus says in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So we've got to understand who Jesus Christ is and that our only access to the Father who's greater than Jesus is through Jesus Christ. We can't get to the Father. We can't have eternal life except through Jesus Christ, except through his blood, except through his grace, except through receiving him personally as our Lord and Saviour. And then everything we do and everything we say is in the name of Jesus Christ. That's why we are a new creation. A few verses on in John chapter 14, verse 20, there was something that Jesus was speaking about, life, that those young disciples, 18, 22 years of age, didn't fully understand. He says, in that day, you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. In other words, Jesus Christ has a, is at a covenant at one with the Father, and we are to be at one with Jesus Christ. Just like the, Jesus spoke his Father's words, we are to speak Jesus' words. Just like Jesus and the Father were one, Jesus prayed that we and he would become one. And that's very powerful, and that's brought out very powerfully in John's Gospel, as well as through the epistles elsewhere. Jesus came from the Father, and he returned to the Father. And we have the testimony that's very powerful, not only in John's writing, but also in Paul's writing. We know that John intensely identified with Jesus as a disciple whom Jesus loved. Now that's not an egotistical boast. John knew what it was like to be both, to be loved. We see that towards the end of his testimony, not in the first part of his testimony. John 19, 20, 21, four times John says that he was a disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, the apostle Paul came later. But listen to Paul, because Paul says the same thing in different words. He, when he, Paul wrote to those at Galatians, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, he identified personally with Jesus Christ on a level very similar to John's. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. So my sin was on the cross. That was my sin up there. I'm the greatest of all sinners. And the grace of God freely was extended to me. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Sorry, let me read that again. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That's really personal, isn't it? That's how Paul identified his life. And the life I now live in the flesh, because we're still in the flesh, we still live in, with sin all around us. I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me. Do you know that you are loved? One of the greatest realizations that we could ever have is a revelation by the Holy Spirit that you are loved. We may have parents that have tried to love us. And some of us have been unfortunate to have parents who did not love us, who brought the abuse and the brokenness and the suffering and sin and perpetuated it into another generation. But God wants you to know that you are loved. God so loved the world a keystone scripture for all of Christianity, 
that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life Paul knew that he was loved and he knew that the son of God gave himself for me this reconciling this reconciliation this redemption from certain sin and death in verse 21 he says I do not nullify the grace of God he's saying this in the same thing because he's received that grace for if righteousness were through the law then Christ died no, for no purpose I was once a Pharisee and I felt that I could achieve my righteousness through law keeping why would I need a sacrifice if I could keep the law and gain some merit points from that and my righteousness of keeping the law outweighed my sin but one drop of poison in a glass of pure water poisons the whole water and sin is like that so righteousness cannot be achieved through the law, even though the law is holy, true, just and righteous. In the flesh, Paul wrote to the Philippians and he said, I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. I am this new creation. I in Christ and Christ in me. Now I have had it said in some of the churches that I have friends in, that the Father is greater than Jesus and therefore we worship the Father. And so within their church culture, Jesus Christ, yes, he is the figurehead of the church. He was the one who came 2,000 years ago, and he's the one who's coming as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But within that church culture, you'd almost think that Jesus wasn't there. He's not in their hymns. He's not in their theology. He's very little in their preaching. He's very little in the minds of the members of those congregations. Don't worry, I came from a Sabbatarian congregation. I cherished my past but also I'm prepared to acknowledge the glaring failures and the blindness that we had to Jesus. In fact, one of the churches in the book of Revelation doesn't have Jesus in there. The Laodicea church has Jesus outside the culture of the church, knocking, calling, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, he's calling out to those who might be listening. I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Is it possible that you can be going to church and studying the scriptures and not have Jesus Christ in your life or truly understand his lordship to have the son as scripture says is to also have the father and I mention this at this particular point because we can only come to the father through Jesus I and the father are one hold that thought in your mind and John says in John chapter 6 44 as he remembers Jesus words where Jesus says, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. And where does the Father draw the new believer? He draws him to Jesus. And then Jesus says, establishes his authority for what will ultimately happen. And I will raise him up at the last day. Only God has the power to raise the dead back to life. And Jesus makes a blessed assurance that he has the power and authority in heaven and on earth to raise the dead. So Jesus is Lord. He's our advocate. He's our high priest. He's our friend, our saviour. In other words, we cannot circumvent Jesus Christ. He is worthy of praise and honour. And if you study the book of Revelation and you study the Gospels, you'll see that Jesus Christ is worthy of worship. And only God is worthy of worship. Now I do want to make some comments as I mentioned earlier on works-based law-based salvation ethos because it can be extraordinarily dangerous. Let me talk about the law. The law of God is holy, just, pure and good. A holy righteous God reflects his will for us to, in order to bring us to Christ. That's what the law is for as a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ to reflect his nature and character so we can begin to understand we who are formed out of the dust of the ground and breathed into the breath of life. So Jesus said, you've heard it said in, in the book of Matthew, thou shalt not commit adultery. That comes out of the Ten Commandments. But I say to you, whoever looks lustfully has already committed adultery in his heart. And so the law of Christ is expounded through Jesus takes the Ten Commandments and shows us its absolute intent. And all of us have failed. All of us have had wandering eyes to some degree. Those shalt not covet is the most power, one of the most powerful 
commandments that relate to human behavior. Coveting predicates murder, lying, thieving, telling every dis disobedient to parents, etc. So, in other words, the holy, righteous God decrees a law that we can't live up to. We fail. We fail miserably. And so the holy, righteous God then sentences us to death because he's holy and true, and we have fallen short of that righteousness. In other words, law-keeping with a works-based emphasis cannot save you. The reason I keep the law is because I am saved in Christ, to receive Christ, to believe in his name, allow myself to be transformed by the Holy Spirit so that I can celebrate on Sabbath. For example, I go to church on Saturday and I could be accused of worshipping the Sabbath rather than the Lord of the Sabbath. Now I keep Sabbath because Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath and I want to enter into his holiness. And the book of Hebrews tells me, therefore there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. This gift that God is given, it's not legalism, it's the grace of God affording me rest in a restless world, breaking the bonds of sin and slavery. I'm slave to work, to serve our work. And God says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And Jesus showed how holiness is exemplified by not, we, we're not to do serve our work, but we, we encourage to do good work. So the blind may see and the deaf may hear, exemplified in Jesus' ministry, which horrified the Pharisees. But we've all sinned, and in Christ, we're all condemned. And God's decree, righteous and true, is judgment. And no matter how we might try to keep Sabbath, we would fail. No matter how we try, that's why the Jews created all these extra rules around it. But did you know only the lawgiver can save us, the righteous judge? And for the way for the lawgiver to save us, was just like the Passover lamb for thousands of years depicted in the, in, the, in, 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 in the story of the ancient Israel. That Passover lamb is Jesus and he would shed his blood as the perfect atonement that would redeem us from certain sin and death. John the Baptist understood this. He saw Jesus at the beginning of his ministry and he said, Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The lamb of God referenced the Passover lamb that was killed once a year. A male lamb, one year old, without blemish, was to be slaughtered, to have his blood spilled. And that was a shadow of what was going to happen in Jesus Christ. And John writes in John chapter 1, verse 14, And the Word, referring to Jesus Christ, became flesh and dwelt among us. And we've seen his glory. What sort of a glory? the glory as of the only Son from the Father. And then John tries to describe the quintessential epitome of Jesus, and he says, full of grace and truth. John says another few verses on, for from his fullness, the fullness of the Father in Jesus Christ, we have all received grace upon grace. Those who received him and believed in his name, and so from his fullness, we've all received, John could have said, truth and grace, or law and grace, or great law and truth. He says, grace upon grace. Favor, unmerited favor has been extended to us, who by God's Spirit opens our eyes to the love given to us. Everything depends on Jesus. The reconciliation work to the Father to himself, the redemption paid on our stead for sin. Everything that we are is because of Jesus Christ. And that puts us in a very grateful position. To be deeply grateful, this is why Christians sing hymns, songs of praise, glorifying God for his, how he explains who we are and how he redeems us from certain death. In fact, the angels in heaven praise God and they honour and praise the Lamb who was slain, singing, Holy, 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 King of Kings and Lord of Lords, because Jesus' blood redeemed us from death, and the sons of God are raised in glory. And all of creation now waits 
the revealing of the sons of God. You and I who believe, who receive Jesus, who bring every thought and subjection to Christ. Now the Pharisees, falsely on the other side of the spectrum, believed that they could earn the same sort of salvation through Torah, through law-keeping, through understanding the prophets. Their problem was that they refused Jesus. They denied him. The Jesus that was full of grace and truth. The two defining characteristics of Jesus Christ, as John understood it, the closest disciple to Jesus, was grace and truth. And unfortunately, in the broader spectrum of Christianity, you have those two ends of the pendulum separate, but not together. You have part of the body of Christ that focuses on doctrine and truth. For example, the church in Laodicea thought they had truth and all understanding. They said, rich, we, we're comfortably well off. We have need of nothing. Because they, ha they didn't have Jesus with them, but they had truth. And Jesus viewed them as pitiful, poor, wretched, blind and naked. That's the description of part of the church of God. Then you have other side of the spectrum. Those who cry out, Lord, Lord, but live lawlessly without obedience and submission to Christ. I appreciate those who understand grace. They have a lot to give to the Christian community. And I appreciate those who stand on the bastion of truth. They have a lot to give. But Jesus was full of grace and truth. And in order to have the perfect harmony of grace and truth, we must come into Christ and allow Christ to be in us and us to be in Christ and that our major defining character is our Christ-centeredness, that everything we say and do is done in the name of Jesus. Because grace without truth becomes a license to sin. And truth without grace is judgmental and self-righteous. Only in Jesus Christ is grace and truth perfectly exemplified. Only is grace and truth truly experienced in Jesus Christ validated in Christ. And so the question that we can ask ourselves is how do I reflect grace and truth if Christ is truly Lord of my life? It's a good question to ask because John reminds us from his fullness we've all received grace upon grace. And now you and I live because of Jesus. He's the Lord of our lives. And so how does the law, how does the truth aspect fit into this? Because we sense sometimes there's a tension. Many people have written books about law and grace um, and, the, and the, what appears to be some sort of tension there. There isn't. The law of God is no longer written externally in tablets of stone. But if Jeremiah under the Old Covenant prophesied, God would write his law into our very hearts. Jeremiah 31 verse 33. This is how what Jeremiah said as he reflected God's words, when God said, I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. So instead of referring to a code of conduct written in stone, even though it was by the finger of God and the voice of God, now it becomes deeply internalized. Where a person never looks lustfully at another person because it's not in their character. Christ is in them in their fullness. Verse 34 of Jeremiah 31, And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and say to his brother, Know the Lord. Listen to this. For they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. God says, I will forgive their iniquity. I'll remember their sin no more. Listen to this. They all will know me, from the least of them to the greatest. And if we read Philippians chapter 2, verse 10, we see that Scripture says that one day every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. That's why Jesus says, when I'm lifted up, when, I've, when I'm crucified, when I'm spilling my blood, I will draw all people to myself. Every knee will bow and every tongue confess to the glory of the Father. So when we pray, when we go before our Heavenly Father, the holy, righteous, true, transcendent God, we come before Him with our requests because the way has been opened through Jesus and we can then pray 
in Jesus' name. Make sure when you pray, and I'm not saying if you pray, when you pray, make sure you emphasize that you are praying in Jesus' name, that you are before the Heavenly Father because of the redemption and the reconciliation that you've experienced in Jesus Christ, that He is Lord of your life, that He is your advocate and high priest, and you saying, I am with Jesus, I am in Jesus. It is Christ, no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. I am the disciple whom Jesus loves. That's very personal. No longer is it external. I am in Christ, and Christ is in me. And so the name of Jesus Christ authenticates our prayer before the Father. Paul says, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. A very, very powerful. Paul also wrote to those in Ephesus. And it's our goal personally, and may it be also our goal collectively as a part of the body of Christ. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. May we work for doctrinal unity. May we be sound theologically. May our doctrines conform to Scripture through the lens and the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Of the knowledge of the Son of God. you know how important the knowledge of the Son of God is? Other than the knowledge of biblical literacy, we must see the Scriptures, the divine inspired words of God through the lens of the knowledge of the Son of God. Otherwise, it's to read those scriptures blindly. To mature manhood. What does mature manhood look like? Of the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The Father is in Christ, and you and I in Christ. Therefore, may we be a part of a Christ-centered church. May we be a Christ-centered people. May we live and reflect His higher glory. Because Paul takes it down to the everyday experience that you and I may have. Whatever you do in word or deed, says Paul, as he wrote to those at Colossae, do all, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So is everything that you say and everything that I say in the name of Jesus? That's the litmus test. That's the calling that we've been given in being reconciled to God and reconciled through Jesus Christ is that everything we say and everything that we do is now in the name of Jesus. So if you stand before a court one day, make sure you speak in the name of Jesus. If you stand before a television camera crew one day, make sure we speak in the name of Jesus. That's the only thing that will authenticate us. Giving thanks to God, the Father through Him. So Jesus, to, to have the Son is to have the Father. To speak in Jesus' name is to have direct access to the Father. So this is back, brings us back individually. Who are you looking out from behind your eyes? Who are you now as you encounter the risen Christ in a very personal and meaningful way? Are we reconciled to God? It's a good question to ask. Are we in Christ then reconcilers about the ministry, the service of reconciliation? being about the work that Jesus has called us to be his eyes and ears and heart and mouth. Is everything that you and I do in Jesus Christ's name? And are we able to love our enemies and do good to those who persecute us in the name of Jesus Christ for the purpose of reconciliation? This is a powerful reality that we need to embrace and understand because the ministry of reconciliation, as Paul understood, has been committed to us to do it in the name of Jesus as followers of Jesus. So what sort of a church would you like to be a part of? What sort of faith community would you be able to be a part of and cherish? Number one, to be a Christ-centered church that's formed by the Holy Spirit, that's Bible-based, that's Sabbath-celebrating. And I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, that wherever you are in your life, I hope that this message of his encouragement and strength, on behalf of Message Week Ministry, the International Ministerial Congress, and the Church of God Seventh Day, in the name of Jesus Christ, I'm your brother, John Classic. <laughs>